focus of the previous video was about changes in Canadian cropping systems over time, so from the 1930s to today. Now I'm going to focus on regional or spatial differences in Canadian cropping systems. And to do that, I'm going to first introduce to you Canada's five main agricultural regions. This is a map produced by Statistics Canada that shows total farm area as a percentage of eco-district area in 2011. And essentially what you see is the darker, those areas with darker colors, a greater percentage of that land base is classified as agricultural land. And areas that are uh, white have no agriculture, no counted agriculture. And this map gives us a pretty good idea of Canada's main agricultural region. There's actually five of them, and so let's go through each of them. The first region I'll cover is the one we're living in, or at least the one we'd all be living in uh, if classes were in person. I guess you guys could be anywhere in the world, really. So we have southern Ontario, um, southeastern Ontario, and eastern, southeastern Quebec. And this is kind of the, the, the strip of land uh, surrounded by the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence, so we have a a moderated climate because of that, uh, quite a humid climate, as you'll see compared to other agricultural regions. And this is an area where we get enough moisture and enough, you know, heat growing degree days to be able to grow crops like corn and soybeans. And so this area is what we would also call part of the Northern Corn Belt. And, and the rest of the Corn Belt extends into the United States, but this is the Canadian part of what we would call the Corn Belt. Again, this region has humid summers, uh, relatively warm summers, and therefore can grow a, a different mix of crop. So with this more favorable climate uh, compared to other areas of Canada, uh, Ontario and Quebec have quite a sizable fruit and vegetable industry. Um, in terms of you know total acreage, about half of uh, Canadian fruit production, for example, is in Ontario and Quebec. So this next region you should be familiar with by now, it's the prairies, of course. The prairies are a major agricultural region. It's hard to generalize in terms of, you know, crop mix and weather uh, it, for, for an area that's so large, right? The prairies stretch from Manitoba to Alberta, so there's quite a bit of diversity within this region. But as a general kind of rule, the prairies would be considered very dry, okay? And so water is a limitation compared to what we have here in Ontario. The Frost-free period is also shorter than it is in Ontario, or at least southern Ontario. And so they have a very short growing season, and their winters are very, very cold, okay? So they, they, they have a harder time growing winter, uh, something like winter wheat. Very little fruit and vegetable production occurs in the prairies. I mean, it's there, but relative to the size of its total land base and relative to you know, fruit and vegetable production in other areas of Canada, very, very little in the prairies. Okay, and so these factors, you know, it's much drier, their winters are colder, and their growing season is much shorter. Those factors are going to constrain the type of cropping systems that, uh, that exist on the prairies. The next region is what's called the Peace River Valley, and it spans between the border of British Columbia and Alberta. It's actually the northernmost field crop production area on the continent. And uh, most people have never heard about it, but it's a major field crop producer as well as uh, livestock, par particularly beef. Uh, again, this is a northern area, so they have a, a short growing season. So you have an interesting mix of crops. Um, you have things like canola, spring wheat, uh, quite a bit of hay and quite a bit of grass seed production. And so when people, when farmers are buying, for example, certified grass seed, you know, seed that's certified free of weeds uh, or a particular species of grass, a lot of that comes from the Peace River area. Again, because it's so cold during the winters and the growing season is so short, they don't have a huge amount of disease or pest pressure that could, um, that could interfere with seed production. This is just some basic climate data from the regions that we've been discussing. And I think they illustrate quite well, you know, the differences in climate. So just looking at annual precipitation, we have a lot more rainfall in, on, in Ontario. Looking at average temperatures over the growing season, 
you can see that it's it's a lot warmer as well. The Maritimes and British Columbia's Fraser River Valley are the other two major agricultural regions I want to touch on. It's hard to generalize about these two regions. They have a very diverse uh, crop mix, so a lot of livestock, field crops, um, forages, I mean, you name it. These areas have relatively long growing seasons uh, and, again, are, are, are quite humid. And so because they have warm, long growing seasons, they have quite a bit of rainfall that occurs in the growing season. They have quite a few options in terms of what, what farmers can grow. These two areas also have uh, pretty sizable specialty crop industries. You can think of, for example, low bush blueberry production in the Maritimes or potatoes. And in the Fraser River, River Valley, um, the greenhouse industry as well as fruit production, uh, tree fruits like uh, cherries and also uh, berries. British Columbia produces primarily high value fruit. So when you look at Canada's overall farm gate value of fruits produced, so the total amount of money farmers receive for their, the, the fruit that he or she sells, about 40% of, of, of that value uh, comes from British Columbia producers, primarily in the Fraser River Valley. So the next part of this lecture, I want to talk about four broad secular trends that are shaping Canadian cropping systems using, of course, a G by E by M approach, which is what we're taking in this class. So what do I mean by secular trends? I mean long-term trends that are not cyclical, they're not seasonal, you know, they're not flavor of the month. They're long-term con consistent trends uh, that are shaping Canadian cropping systems. Of course, from year to year, uh, you know, fluctuations in crop prices are going to affect cropping system diversity, for example. But these are major secular trends that have been going on for, you know, 40 years or more. Secular trend the first is the decline in forage production in Eastern Canada, excluding the Maritimes, specifically looking at Quebec and Ontario. And so here you have, this is all data from Statistics Canada, tame hay, which I'm using as a proxy for forages uh, in general, uh, the area of tame hay harvested by province uh, between 1970 and 2019. And if you look at Ontario, uh, which is that red line, and Quebec, which is the purple line, we see uh, just an overall decline in a hay production. If you look at the Maritimes, it's, it's held steady. If you look at uh, the prairies, so Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, those areas have seen an increase in tame hay harvested area or at least the maintenance of, of that harvested area. So it's really only in Ontario and Quebec where we've seen a pretty large decline in over the past 50 years in, in forage. Another interesting thing to note is the sudden decline in hay acreage in 2003, and it's almost complete rebound the next year. Uh, this is especially noticeable in Alberta, that yellow line where we get a huge drop in 2003 and then a recovery the next year. This is a... Uh, there's a clear seasonal trend going on here. So what happened in 2003? So you guys are probably too young to remember, but it was big news when it happened. Uh, there was one cow in Alberta that was found to have what was called or what is called mad cow disease. Okay, There's a more scientific name for that, right? but it's uh, eluding me right now. Uh, the details don't really matter, but it's a bad disease. You don't want to have it or you don't want cows to have it. And there's this one cow that did have mad cow disease. And almost overnight, uh, all export markets for Canadian beef products uh, shut down, right? No other country, they all banned the import of Canadian beef products. I mean, they did not want this mad cow disease getting into their own domestic beef herds or, or, or harming people or whatever. Okay, so, you know, there was a complete shutdown of the Canadian beef trade export uh, in 2003 for... Um, you know, a number of months, depending on which country, uh, you know, how long each ban lasted. And so in any case, that's, you know, an effect of a, a like a sudden kind of shock. You have a, a decline in hay, hay production and then it's recovery once those export markets are restored.
What you're looking at is a map produced by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada of pasture land as a proportion of total farmland. And this is data from 1996, so things might have changed a little bit uh, in the intervening 24 years, as the previous slide would suggest. Uh, but the, the main thing to note here is that our intensive pasture-based cropping systems are located in the western part of the country. Okay, that's the Fraser River Valley in British Columbia and also the western part of the prairies. There's some pockets in Ontario that are very highly, uh, you know, pasture intensive. You have some areas of eastern and northern Ontario, but again, that's changed over the last 24 years. So the amount of livestock production in a agricultural region is going to have important consequences for the types of cropping systems that predominate in that area. And this is some real world data to illustrate what I'm talking about. So this is data from the uh, most recent census of agriculture. And these are two counties in Ontario, Stormount, Dundas, and Glengarry in Eastern Ontario and Chatham, Kent in Southwestern Ontario. So Stormount has 4% of all the cattles, cattle and calves in the province. Okay, that's their 4%, four out of 100 of those cattle and calves are in Stormount, Dundas, and Glengarry County. Uh, conversely, 0.9% of cattle and calves are in Chatham, Kent. Okay, so we have different livestock intensities. And, that, and then when we look at the crop, the mix of crops that are grown, in terms of the proportion of land area in these counties, you know, the livestock intensity is reflected uh, in, that lives, in that cropping system mix. So in uh, Stormount, Dundas, and Glengarry, SDG, we have quite a bit of soybean grown, quite a bit of corn for grain grown, but we also have quite a bit of hay uh, and also corn for silage. And corn for silage is essentially corn that is uh, the whole plant is harvested and then ensiled for cattle consumption. When we look at Chatham-Kent, we have virtually no corn for silage or hay being grown in that county. Instead, we have corn, soybeans, and uh, to a lesser extent, winter wheat. Secular trend number two is the virtual elimination of summer fallow in Canada. This is primarily a practice that was done in, in the prairies, uh, drier parts of Canada, but, but summer fallow was practiced really throughout, throughout Canada. So, so what is summer fallow? It's a cropping system practice where you grow a crop every second year. Okay, so one year there's almost nothing growing. It's fallow, that land. And the idea is that in the year the crop, there's no crop being grown, you're giving that land, you're giving that soil time to accumulate moisture and nitrogen. Okay, so rainfall that hits that land or snow that melts is going to percolate into the soil profile where it can be stored uh, for a year and then be used by the next crop. Okay, it just, there, it, in certain parts of the country, there was just was not enough soil moisture and, and rainfall over the growing season to support two, one crop a year. Now, because there's no crop being grown in one of those two years, there's quite a bit of soil erosion that can happen in the fallow year. So, um, you know, summer fallow is just not a, a good thing. It leads to erosion and it's land that could be used productively, produce cash flow for a farmer that isn't. So 50 years ago in 1970, one third of the Canadian prairies were in summer fallow. Okay, that's 15 million hectares. Okay, and, and that means that you have, you know, two or three Ontario's worth of agricultural land that were just laying fallow in the prairies. Okay, that's how much land was in summer fallow, just a huge amount. And so today it's only about two and a half million hectares. So again, it's it's kind of like Canada, Canadian agriculture discovering two or three Ontario Ontario's worth of agricultural land uh, by reducing summer fallow. So what happened? Why why do we have this major reduction in summer fallow over the past 50 years. So let's take a G by E by M approach to try to answer this question. So first was the introduction of better adapted crops, so lentils and canola, as well as better crop varieties, so improved varieties of wheat that could simply yield well in uh, very dry areas. And so 
it became economic and indeed possible to grow crops continuously in uh, dry areas where previously farmers relied on summer fallow because of uh, varieties were just not as uh, adapted to, to drier, these dry areas. Uh, the E, so environment has also changed over the past 50 years. There's been, on, on average, uh, in the prairies, there's more cloud cover. And that means that there's less overall evaporation during the summer. And so with less evaporation, you, you have uh, more soil, uh, sorry, more mo soil moisture, you know, water in the soil available for crop use to transpire. We've also seen an increase about 10 millimeters a decade on average of rainfall during the growing season. And so again, that just means that there's just the, a little bit more water, you know, 50 millimeters more water on average uh, in the prairies to support, you know, crop production. So thinking about the M factor, what, what has changed in terms of management has been an overall move towards reduced tillage systems. Okay, so tillage is used by farmers, for example, to control weeds. There's some amount of tillage or soil disturbance involved in planting normally. Uh, but what tillage does, and, and sometimes that's the aim of the farmer, but probably not in the prairies, but what tillage does is it actually dries out the soil, right? You're, you're taking, you know, soil that's, you know, 10 or 15 centimeters below the surface. You're mixing it up. You're exposing it to the atmosphere. You're exposing it to wind and to the sun. And so you dry out soil. Soil dries out via tillage. And so by reducing tillage, you know, adopting herbicides, low disturbance seeding, no-till technology, by reducing tillage in the prairies, farmers are effectively conserving soil moisture better, provi uh, providing more water to their crop. So we stay in Western Canada for secular trend number three, which is that in the prairies, wheat and canola are by far the most important field crops by acreage. I mean, nothing really comes close uh, except tame hay, which isn't a field crop. Uh, um, but oats, barley, flaxseed, I mean, nothing really comes close to the acreage uh, demanded uh, by wheat and canola. Okay, so when we think about the beneficiaries of summer fallow or the reduction in summer fallow, it is these two crops that really take the cake. And uh, it should not be surprising that up, up until a couple of years ago, canola was the number one in terms of financial value, the number one crop in Canada. It's a different story in Eastern Canada where different crop species have dominated the cropping systems uh, in the region. Here it's corn and soybeans. Okay, canola, very little canola. Wheat is a distant third and that's winter wheat as opposed to in the prairies where it's mostly spring sown wheat. In 1970s, where this graph starts, oats was actually the number one crop in terms of har harvested acreage, but that's declined precipitously. It is really corn and soybean that's dominating the rotation uh, in eastern Canada.